If I can have, if I can have your attention, just I want to mention real quick uh, that we have some. I'm just going to pass this bag around. These are flash drives, the the kind that you can put around your wrist. And so you're free to take one. We have one for everybody. We'd love for you to have one. Um, no, I believe there's enough for everybody. And if there isn't, well, the last few can arm wrestle. One per customer. One per customer. <laughs> well, yeah, one per customer. I'll pass these out in a minute. Uh, and then next I just want to turn over again to Alma. Um, there's a good saying that says, uh, w sometimes when you don't know, get the hell out of the way. Let somebody else who does do it. And so you're going to take over the rest of the afternoon, and I'll come back at the end. Thank you. Let me tell you a little bit about the work. Uh, in the afternoon, if you notice it's an arrow, the part two, this is a cold group activity. We have approximately 30 minutes to do this. So what we're gonna do is literally, since we're already numbered off, one, two, three, four, that's the order that we're gonna go up. So what we're gonna look at is you selected a reporter, or you should have selected a reporter for each of the groups. It can be any other person in the school district, but that person will have a couple of tasks. This is just, a, again, just a kind of a, a, a framework of some of the questions that you're, where we would have asked each other. Uh, we're gonna share what the ISD is doing. Remember, in the two different areas, let me show you real quick. This is what we have talked about. The college readiness framework, the related college access policy, and the related college uh, completion policy. And again, these were just examples for us to get the conversation going. I also wanted to point to your attention that of the things that your school district is, is doing right now, what is yielding the best results? The reason we want to do that, two reasons. Number one, uh, I heard a story not too long ago that a funder says, we will go where the evidence takes us. Ah. So if the evidence says that you're doing a really good job in really trying to get more students college access, college persistence, and college completions, <coughs> then funders will go and knock on your door and say, we want a piece of that action. We not only want to know how you're doing it, but we want to scale what you're doing it and doing. So what if we go into a partnership so that we can develop those types of, of activities? Is this yours or That's yours. Good. <laughs> <coughs> so the last thing there, before that word silo, <coughs> The silo meant that you are working fast and furious, but within your school district, you're working fast and furious with your partners, you're working fast and furious with your institutions of higher ed. So now, remove that cap or that lens and put on a new one where it says college for all. In alignment with the San Antonio 2020 goals and the diplomas goals. So now we have our individual goals that go a step further to support the city of San Antonio's, <coughs> the mayor's goals of the 20, the SA 2020. Now remember, we go where the evidence takes us. You all represent over 65% of all of the students in San Antonio. If we get it right, these four school districts, we're gonna have more than 50% of impact in the city of San Antonio. People will come and wanna visit. They will come to one to really in, um, interview you. They're gonna give you support. The TV stations will be here interviewing you and saying, how did you move that needle? Not only that, how are you doing the transformational change? <coughs> it's not about moving minor improvements, it's about really having huge impacts. We don't wanna move just a little bit, we wanna move really, really into the bigger arena of really making an impact in our community. And the last one, we talked about SA 2020 and diplomas, it's an opportunity of you to go back and now, when you're writing your framework and your plan for college access, uh, persistence, and completion, don't forget to put in those two columns. How are they aligning to the work that we're doing as a whole? So with that said, well, I'm gonna start off with group number one, San Antonio ISD, you good? <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Miguel Elizondo, I'm the principal of the Near High School in San Antonio Independent School District. Uh, what we're doing in, in our district is uh, a few years ago when I first got into the district, the push was uh, making sure kids were standing on the edge. 
And it, it was more of a symbolic meaning because every time that kids graduate, at graduation, they actually stand on, on a neck when their name is called out. So we wanted every kid in our district to stand on the X. And there was a vertical alignment from pre-K all the way through high school. And that was the point. <coughs> every kid in SAISD within those boundaries and anybody that comes outside of those boundaries will stand on the X. Not, are you going to stand on the X? It's, yes, you are. And so that was a belief that we all had, that we all bought into. And so if you see this pamphlet, this is something that we give to our, our staff. This is something that we give to our parents, to business uh, leaders in our community as well. Now, that was the first push because we know that there has to be a start to every end. And for us, it's never going to end because we're always going to push for uh, graduation from high school. But we know that that's not where it's going to stop. So you notice here it says, <laughs> know how to go to beyond the X to Y and Z. So that X is where you're going to stand. And Y is, okay, what am I going to do after high school? Okay, am I going to a four-year university? Am I going to a local community college? Am I going to a trade school? And uh, Ms. Garcia, right? Ms. Garcia gave a, a, a perfect story that is very symbolic to me because on my campus I have a large special education population. She talked about a kid telling the uh, superintendent that, well, I'm not going to college. Okay, well, that's fine. You don't have to go to college, but I'm going to get you ready anyway so that when you do decide to go, if you ever decide to go, you're ready regardless. For my kids, some of my students may not have the, 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 the capacity to go to a four-year university. However, we have a lot of students whose uh, learning disabilities uh, do not stop them from learning a trade that they love. And I'll give you a perfect example. Last year we had a young man who went to the National Skills USA competition representing our automotive program. I mean, this kid went to the National Skills USA competition and is a, a kid with a, uh, a learning disability. He's good at what he does. We had people that came from the Netherlands to come see our career pathway programs and what we offer and how we do, or how we do business at Lanier High School to make sure that our kids are graduating and being successful. And this young man presented to people from the Netherlands and they almost cried because they couldn't believe, they couldn't believe that our kids at Lanier High School, some who are special ed, some who are left kids, some who have uh, major uh, economic disabilities, financial disabilities are being successful because th they were just in awe of how much passion and pride our kids have. And it started with us talking to them about the X. And it didn't start with me at high school because we all know there's a vertical alignment within clusters. And so it started somewhere. So that was our push. Our push is now to get to that why. How can we get our kids <coughs> to be successful outside of high school? So you saw our, our results on ACT, on SAT. We know that we're struggling with that. So how do we improve that? Well, we start with this again because we talk to our teachers. We now have to move on from just graduating from high school to college and career readiness. And my campus, what I've done is I've aligned my campus goals to what uh, SA 2020 does. For me, I think uh, it's more important to have short-term goals. So what I did is we created a, a Vision 2015. And in those three years, uh, my, my department chairs and my staff agreed that we're gonna focus on three things only. Number one, quality instruction. We have to improve the, the, the instructional practices in the classroom by all staff members. Number two, we're going to work on, on graduation. And what does graduation entail? It entails, it entails improving our attendance rate. If kids aren't in school, they're not going to graduate, okay? Uh, we're, we're going to work on our tier two and tier three students that are, are having issues with behavior and academics. And what we did is we created a graph that showed kids that are having issues with academics only, and then those kids that are having issues with behavior. If kids are having issues with behavior, they're going to struggle in class. If kids are having issues with academics, they're going to misbehave. So we're trying to come up with a plan. We brought in an at-risk coordinator to help those kids. The third major component that we said we were gonna focus on was college and career readiness. And I told y'all about our career pathways. I don't talk to my kids about only going to college or university. If those kids are studying a career pathway, I wanna make sure that those teachers that are teaching in those career pathways are, are being held accountable. So one of the things that we're gonna be working on is that when a kid enters a career pathway at ninth or 10th grade, we document who those kids are. And in four years, it's going to be expected that those teachers make sure that at least 90% of the kids that started in ninth grade are being accredited by whatever career pathway they chose. So that those kids are ready, already certified when they come out of high school. So 
not only are we working on, co on college ready, but we're also working on career pathways. Now, what about <coughs> college ready? We've already uh, worked out a, a plan to get many of our pre-AP kids into an SAT class within the school day. I remember when I was in high school, they brought in a special person to come in my senior year and teach me about SAT. You're not gonna teach me these, these huge big words in a semester when I've been talking nothing but Spanish and slang at home. And it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to go through that process as a student because you're like, what is this? What does that mean? And then the teachers are like frustrated because we're not learning this. So what are we doing? We're putting these kids in SAT classes, their freshman and sophomore years, and what we wanna do is see how that's going to work with our, our pre-AP kids and then move it to where we can do something school-wide because it does cost a lot of money, so we have to make sure that, that we're, we get our bank for our buck and we have to see if it works with them first and then we can fix it to make sure where it works for all of our kids. The next thing is the average strategies. We're implementing average strategies across the building to all kids, starting with note-taking. It's a simple, simple task that kids have to learn, but they don't learn it because we never teach it to them. So we're doing that as well. So those are some of the things that we're doing on our campus. Three items that we're focusing on, uh, similar to what he was talking about earlier, um, as far as you, you, you focus the things you need to work on, and then you put all your resources into the things that you're focusing on, and then you move from there. So that's what we're doing at Lanier High School as far as aligning what we're doing in our district at our campus with SA 2020. Now I'll pass it over to Dr. Rosales, who's gonna talk a little bit about the related college access policy, uh, because we have a lot, of, a lot of programs in the district that are out there to provide our students the accessibility to college. And she, she works with those programs on a daily basis, so she's gonna go over that. Uh, real briefly, and we'll talk a little bit about how the, the things that we're doing are yielding uh, success for, for our campuses and our district. Got a vision. Okay, so for uh, college access policy, we talked about the four Ps, transportation, testing, tuition, and textbooks. <laughs> four Ps. Um, so the one concern is you know, of course the college textbooks, uh, college professors <coughs> like to change books, unlike PEA where we have them for 10 or 15 or 20 years, <laughs> uh, the same book. And they're quite expensive, those college textbooks. So we're always looking for a funding source for that. And transportation, of course, if it is, they're going to a career and technology class at a college, then the school district can be reimbursed uh, by the state, but if it's for academics, then they cannot. And um, testing, you know, the act, we all are, in our district, we are, have every high school is an active place or test center. And I think many of us in the room have the same thing because it's much cheaper to test students at your home high school than transport them to the college. So we've been trying to do some things to you know, really eliminate every barrier that we can for students so that when they go, they don't have to figure out where do I go test. No, I've already taken care of the testing at school. I've already completed a flight Texas at school. I've already submitted all my applications so that when they actually get to the college, they're there to have their transition meeting, or meet with the counselor, but they're not, their first experience is not having to run around all over the college to find this room and, and that room um, to find the right person to speak to. So I guess if we had, um, we had to make changes, it would be just to eliminate barriers for, for students. So how, what successes are we seeing? I know with graduation we said we were gonna stand on the X, that every kid was going to stand on the X. Our projected data for graduation rates for this school year, uh, almost every high school in our district, for the exception of two, one of which is in here, are above 90% graduation rates. Uh, for, for our campus, it's going to be at about 85%, which compared to about four years ago, it's almost a 10% increase. What's most important for me on my campus, and we've worked on this since I first got there, is the graduation rates for number one, our left kids, and our graduation rates for our special ed students. And our, those graduation rates for our campus have increased for almost about 15 to 20% in the last three or four years. So we're seeing success, we, we, we know where we're at right now, now we need to do the same thing that we did for graduation rates for, for college and career readiness, thank you.
Wow. That's, yeah, that's the way we do it in San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So number two, just to kind of read, while you're coming up, I'm going to recap real quickly. It was very well um, articulated in this group that if the people of authority are not part of this whole decision making and bringing together like the policy changes, the four T's, testing, tuition, transportation, and textbooks, you know what, we can plan all we want, but unless there's a flexibility and a change in some of those, we're going to have a lot of challenges. So I'm glad that policy was part of the discussion here and how to get um, students more, more students college ready. Sir, if you could say your name and your district and then. Thank you. Dennis Alexander, I'm with Northside Independent School District. Uh, in our discussion and talking about what we're already doing, we already have a strategic planning <coughs> process where we uh, make a lot of these kinds of decisions and that strategic planning rolls into our district improvement plan. So we target a lot of things in that plan. One of the things we talk about in our group is the fact that we need to talk to students about what the purpose of education is, to give them a purpose. Even when we're talking about going to college, we need to have them understand that college has a purpose and that going to college is not the ultimate outcome. That we need to talk to them about career. And we need to do more of it than we're currently doing. I think we uh, hear from parents very often that we need to start talking to students about what are you going to do, what are you going to prepare for earlier and earlier instead of just waiting. When you wait till high school to start talking to students about that, it's really too late. Um, we talked about we need to involve students in something. If we're having them choose a career, or if they choose a career, at Northside we have five magnet programs that students can go to. When they choose one of those, we find that that's always a good thing. Uh, last night I was at a presentation where students from Alamo Academy stood up in front of a group of parents, and both of these uh, young people, and I say young, I'm pretty sure this first student that talked is not shaving yet. <laughs> he went to the academies and is just out and is working for the Air Force. And he said when he went into Alamo Academies, he didn't want to go. He did not want to apply. Mama made him do it. And so now he's so involved that he is now working for the Air Force and they are paying him to go to college. The other students spoke with to ITSA Academies, if you're familiar with ITSA, she said the same thing. My mom made me do it. I didn't want to do it, and now, you know, you couldn't uh, keep her away. About a month ago, I was at our health careers high school. Six seniors got up and reported out and said exactly the same thing. They had no intention of coming to health careers high school, but their parents talked them into it. And for every one of these students, it was at least two years before they made the decision to go into health career. So the point of that is that many times when you involve students in something, there's not a negative side to that. They make a choice, they get some skills, and in most cases, you're gonna find that they're gonna latch onto it and continue on. Um, what results? What's yielding the best results? Uh, we look at a lot of our numbers and, and we know what our graduation rates are and all of that, but our discussion was that we probably don't know, after hearing Greg talk, as much as we need to know about our special programs that we're involved with. We discussed the idea that you know, we have AVID, we have all these partners, um, we do AP credit, we do dual credit, but we really don't have the data that tells us, are those specific programs impacting and helping kids make uh, the transition to college? So while we know some things, uh, we probably need to look into that and find out some additional things. We spend a lot of time in our district at a event we call day to day where we sit and spend an entire day going through uh, all of our data campuses go through all of their individual data 
and it gives them a lot of information about where they need to focus, about all the special populations and so forth. But we do need to look into the fact that what if the student gets a certification at Microsoft or some other certification? We don't know the answer to whether that helps transition that student to college or not. We know that it would help them pay for college once they get there. <laughs> Uh, how are we aligning to the 2020 and diplomas? Um, we have a whole lot of overlap. Well, we probably, as a group, need to spend a little more time uh, focusing on that and trying to see exactly how we're going to align those. We uh, really ran out of time before we had that discussion to any extent. So, thank you. Very briefly, who do you bring to the day-to-day -day conversations? Everyone. <laughs> every principal in the district, every central office personnel, everyone comes in. And in, in that uh, event, everyone receives a binder that's about this, wow. this thick, along with a, a flash drive that has all the information. So you're able to look at it from the district perspective, plus at every campus. Wow and at every subpopulation level. Thank you. Can I add a, a brief comment to that? They bring, the campuses bring their principal and they bring all of their administrators. And if there is room, and over the last two years, Northside's grown too fast, we've run out of room. We used to be able to bring our ELA and our math, or our math and science coordinators. And what I would add to what Dennis said um, is that if we don't walk away with more questions than that binder gives us answers to, we're not looking hard enough. So that is the goal, that the data is this deep and rich, but the campus plans and district plans that come out of it need to be centered on what else do we need to know and how are we going to get it and then how are we going to improve basically. <coughs> yeah. Can I also add on their behalf that with this, with this particular team, because we wanted to stay true to the frameworks idea, um, there was a lot of detailed information really getting into the nuanced aspects of all the programs and, and approaches to engage with students and et cetera. And we really challenged them to kind of pull up, you know, and, and look at all their activities from about 30,000 feet and kind of big picture, boiling it down to key guiding principles or elements of their framework and not focus so directly on all the unique aspects of or their various approaches. And so some of the things that they were able to do was to kind of look at the first aspect of college readiness, that framework from an instructional and um, operational breakdown and then within there there were various aspects or issues that they they considered as it related to the access policy and also moving them forward to the college completion I mean the yeah, college completion policy. And so I think with them really you know pushing to get them to focus there, I think that a number of you may not realize how directly your policies and the way that you engage your students even from the earliest ages have great impact on the college completion and the student culture. And so I know that they feel a little less comfortable talking about that, but I really have to applaud them for the way that they, they embrace that concept and begin connecting what they're doing to those overarching concepts in their framework. Thank you. Thank you. One minute and 40 seconds, that means that I'm going to take advantage of it. You know, one thing, yeah. that, one thing that us poor facilitators since we're working in the individual groups, it would be good if just by the raise of your hand, how many of you are in an administrative role at your campus? Administrative role, all right? How many of you have everything you ever wanted to know and, and are involved with curriculum and instruction? Curriculum and instruction, all right? The other one is, how many of you delve and love data and analyzing and research? 
Uh-huh. And then the last one, the last one is everything you ever wanted to know about counseling, counselors, and home group. <laughs> All right. So those four groups, those four groups, you will have some. Um, you will have a role later on at activity number three, and we're going to be dividing into those four different groups, and we'll share with that with you in just a little bit. So now we have the next group, and the next group is number three. Harlan. I'm Brenda Bernal. I'm the College Readiness Specialist for Harlandale Independent School District. Just to have you all know, this is my initiation. I'm brand new. <laughs> um, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about our goals and um, how we're, we're enthusiastic about uh, raising those those uh, those goals that we have. But just just to touch on our what are we doing? I'm going to give you just a few ideas. Our college readiness activities. Primarily, we want to educate our students not only on curriculum, but we need to educate them on college readiness. I think it's important for them because you'd be surprised how many students don't know what an apply Texas is. You'd be surprised how many of those students sit and take an SAT and don't know what's going to be on the SAT. And so as a district, we need to start educating them, not only in curriculum, but also in college readiness. We emphasize parent meetings. We're trying to emphasize parent meetings, uh, presentations, trying to get to the elementary, middle school for PTA meetings, uh, giving them a presentation on college readiness and what our goal is in, as a district. We want to stress that college readiness and college career are both pretty much the same thing. And the reason for that is because in the past, Whenever, college, whenever careers were mentioned, they were taboo. And now, we need to make them all one. We need to make college readiness and college career one because in, in order for them to have a career, they have to pass a certificate. And on that certificate, it's important for them to read and write. And so for college readiness, it's important for us to keep them out of remedial courses. So those are our emphasis on college readiness. Um, <clears throat> Positive, we need to be, we need to make it a positive testing culture. You know, our kids hate taking exams, and we all know why. So we need to change that culture and make it positive. We need to let them know what's on those exams, how it helps them, where they go with those, and, and change that whole initiative to become <coughs> positive. Educating our parents, giving them field trips. We've been doing field trips for the middle school and just seeing the excitement on their faces is, has been wonderful because they've never been on a, on a university campus. So those are things that we're doing. Um, we have AVID programs in middle school that we just started and in high school this is their second year. So those are other things. We started tailgates for the middle schools. Our universities have stepped up and come and represented their universities. And so we set up tailgates and we get them in there and the parents love it because they're getting information on those tailgates and we're starting them early. We had some universities that have joined us in this mission and I'd like to mention those universities because I think it's important. We have Trinity University, UTSA, and Texas A&M College Station. Those are the universities that have pretty much stepped up and helped us with those. Now our best results, of course, we have to brag. Our best results are from the school testing. We had 95% and y'all heard that this morning. Our college readiness culture that we're trying to spread from pre-K to, to the 12th grade. We want that to become a part of every single one of our schools. And um, the principals and getting the, getting the principals from the principals all the way down to the cafeteria and the custodians. Feeling the culture of college readiness, we feel is important also. Um, how do we align it? Well, our culture is the best representation. <coughs> that's our representation from our campuses. We have a, a college enrollment that's second in the city and we're very proud of that. 
and we're wanting to hold on to that and make it even better. What do we have to work on? We have everything going toward the application process. Now what we want to work on is completion, getting these kids to complete the college and university level. Thank you. We have five minutes, which is great. We're ahead of the ball game. So, group number four, Southwest. Yes. <laughs> Your name is this issue. All right, so my name is Liz Ozuna, and I'm the uh, director for advanced academics for Southwest ISD. And I think today actually marks the end of my fifth month with the district. So I'm the new kid on the block with this. So um, we started out, we actually have a framework that we've been working on um, in trying to, to, to figure out how to make this a district-wide initiative because we knew we needed to start early with elementary school. We have the metaphor that I've used recently, um, and I, I apologize, was the thousand points of light. The problem with the thousand points of light is that if it doesn't make a picture, it isn't a good initiative. And so we're looking for that way to pull all those points of light together because we're doing a lot of stuff. But the question was, is it making any difference and is it impacting all the students that we want to? So as we started our conversation, what we realized our framework was missing and that we've been grappling with is, and, and Northside I think pointed this out really well for us, is that comprehensive guidance and counseling program that touches every student that we know is intentional, that's incorporating what we want it to. But we also realized that's, that's not just about counselors. So we started with talking to adding, about adding that piece to the, to the framework, that, that we have that, but it's well defined. But then what we know we need to do is create um, a guidance, um, both philosophy, but also initiative that clearly includes and well-defined roles for all parts of the system, because we know that parents that students in peer tutoring with each other, that counselors, but that teachers, teachers are the ones that see the students every day. And, and this isn't to take away from the role of the counselor, but it's also making sure that teachers understand what we're trying to do, what uh, the power that they have with students and how they can help students decide what that future is, where the resources are so that they can help us, not only with the students, but to create that culture. Um, helping parents and then also helping partners know what they can do. And frequently, um, I think I heard Greg talk about this, we have a lot of resources, but we don't use them very well. We don't coordinate that very well. So really clearly defining the, the roles that the partners play for us. And we think then, we, we actually said, okay, what would it look like if we looked at one thing that we know that we're, that we're um, starting with? And we looked at the idea of the PSAT. We've, we've just recently taken on the, the College Board Pathway. And so um, we've also been really fortunate to be able to open up a Go Center at an elementary school. And so um, Katrina shared with us that when she's, and, and, and our, uh, Katrina's and my commitment was that we would draft some sort of a curriculum for elementary schools to use, that she would test this out, that we'd make some sort of agreement on what we felt like K through five, this, this college knowledge, because we're, we're talking about being aware. And so um, I, I'm here to stand before you and tell you she's having fifth graders take a look at the FAFSA form and work on filling that out. So that by the time they get to us in high school, they're gonna, they're gonna have at least some familiarity with it. Will they understand it in depth? No. But exposing them to that that early, and, and the, our Go Center also includes a parent component, so that means parents are gonna start thinking about that early. So we think we've got something there. Um, so as we're talking about that, we're, we're starting to, to identify the vocabulary that we know that we want students to have that directly relates to this idea of, of future career, future college. Um, we've got Lear and Me happening. So as they move then from elementary school, we're trying to reinforce some of those executive skills that they bring forward from Lear and Me, but we're looking for something else. We've taken a look at No Excuses University. Um, which, you know, I have to tell you, there's nothing new in that. They've just taken, he's taken and combined some of the things that we all know in here, and he's the first one to tell you, you don't have to buy what I'm selling. You just have to decide what your focus is gonna be and do it, which was a, a really fabulous message. Um, so once they're aware at elementary school, we're working then on getting them prepared at middle school, 
we've really taken a look at our curriculum and we're implementing a systemic curriculum. We've decided on springboards 6 through 12 um, in math and ELA for all students because we want all students to be college prepared. So now we're starting to face not only the idea of implementation with fidelity for all students with that, but then how we differentiate for some of our upper level students. And so we're starting to take a look at some of that. Um, as we move up the line to high school, of course we start with Ready Step um, at eighth grade. We've also started a data initiative, and there are two things that are happening with that. We're trying to look at data differently with students, and one of the commitments that we've made is to create what we're calling the assessment universe, star is not our star, um, to provide principals with a concept of the fact that students are not defined by their star or their EOC score, and we frequently look at them that way, or they're not defined by their special pop coding. There are a lot of other things that we want to look at. So we're looking at creating an assessment piece and a one-pager. My, my goal is to make a one-pager that we can share with principals and teachers and then eventually parents and students to give them the vocabulary of assessment so they understand why they take the PSAT. I was shocked to find out that teachers didn't realize national, we had some teachers that didn't realize national merits came from PSAT. That's a problem to me, but it's an easily solved one and it's free. All we have to do is talk about that. And then, um, um, helping them understand what the progression of those tests are and what that data tells us because we do get a lot of data back from college boards. Um, we are looking at, as we've talked about college, we've talk, we actually talked about post-secondary. So we're looking at the idea that a student could choose to go to a five-week program, a 10-month program, a one-year program, a two-year program, a four-year program, but that we don't decide that that we leave all those, we, we make sure that we've talked with students, we've made sure that they're prepared, we've made sure that the parents understand what their options are. That's why we want all students filling out the FAFSA, we want all students to fill out Apply Texas, because if they don't choose to use it immediately after graduation, they've been through it once, and the chances are they'll be able to do it again when they need to. So then I think we were asked to talk about um, what we think the, the successes are. Um, so we're, we're, we're aiming at better college knowledge, making sure that students understand what they need to understand to be able to not only arrive, but to, to survive and then thrive in that environment. We want them to be prepared to make the choices that they want to. We want them to complete. Um, we want all points of our system to know when and how to intervene. So if the student isn't meeting some of the benchmarks that we've set or isn't completing some of the things that we've set, we want all of the stakeholders in our system to know how to help out. Um, we're also looking at better vertical collaboration between, um, we have a high percentage of students that go to the Alamo colleges, especially at Palo Alto. So we're talking about possible uh, collaboration with the advisors there, um, especially in the summertime to help some of the summer melt but also to help them get past what we think could be an obstacle with the new requirements for the MyMap and OLA, because it, there are several hours of modules that they have to complete, so we're looking to work with them better. So we think we'll have more students enter um, so that we're meeting some of the, the 2020 goals. Um, and I think that was it. I think I covered everything I wanted to. Very good. Did I have time left? Uh, you sure did. Oh, Two great. Minutes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so there's a lot of activities. One other thing that Elizabeth brought up to the attention of all of us, that if you notice, we're still speaking to each other on this is what we do. This is what my school does. This is how we are addressing. Pretty soon, this is what we're going to say when people ask us. This is what we do in San Antonio. All the schools <coughs> coming together to work. We're focusing on some goals that the mayor has uh, uh, bravely and boldly given us some uh, what we call the higher level at, um, goals. And we have different initiatives in place that we're going to try to align the work that we do. So right now, that's why today's activity is about individually. <coughs> what is really moving that educational needle in the direction that we need to go? And it's obvious that there's so much learning that can happen amongst each other. You know, real quickly, uh, not too long ago, um, a superintendent tells me, you know, I learned something about professional development. I said, really, what did you learn? He said, well, I learned that two school districts down the road from where I, from where, where my school district is, 
I ran into them in California, and I told them, man, you guys are doing great work. He had to go to California to find out that that's what they're doing. All right, we don't even know what's happening across the street. So this is the type of activity, when we start talking about collective impact, it's about what activities are becoming now what we call schools of excellence where we can go learn from each other. They become demonstration schools where we not only have, there's no more called, we don't call them best practices anymore, they have to be proven practices. What does your data say that proves that it's a best practice? Best practice is fluff. Prove it that it's a best practice. That's why we start digging really deep into the, the conversations about what is the data telling us that we can mark it off as something that's good for all students. So now we're going to go into activity number two. And let me explain a little bit about what we're going to be doing. So you're going to be getting up off of your seats one more time. In activity number two, in your template, we have a template that's called the Luminous Template that you will be completing goals or goals. The key areas of focus, metric strategies, and timelines. I want you to note again that the key academic college readiness concepts have to do with what is already research-based. We know that the focus has to be on cognitive strategy skills, content knowledge, and academic behaviors. And then the last thing is that we know that these are related college access uh, concepts embedded with college knowledge and navi navigation skills. Students, parents, community members, anyone that touches students, maybe I shouldn't say touches students. <laughs> Anybody that works with students, that touch kids, okay, don't touch kids. Um, anybody that works with a student has to understand the navigation skills. Do you know, even now, with everything that's available, students are sh showing up in universities and colleges on the first day of school and say, where's, where's my schedule? Yeah. What do you mean, where's your schedule? Yeah, where's my schedule? Like in high school, you know, you go in August, you're going to schedule and go to college. Uh, I, I know, they climbed out of a rock somewhere. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that, you know, uh, Greg, we were talking about the smaller rural schools. In the state of Texas, there's approximately 1,200 school districts. 900 of them are small and rural. All right, small and rural. Do you think master teachers work in small and rural school districts? The answer is yes. Yes. Those are far and few, but they, they do. And that's where we can go and learn. If we already know that 900 school districts, approximately 900 school districts in the state of Texas are small and rural, then policy has to be different in those school districts. The way we service them, the way we recruit teachers, the way the pre-service colleges and universities work. So again, it's a whole village that takes uh, us to educate each other about what, what we're doing in our school system. So part two, after you finish reviewing and filling out the templates with <coughs> the metrics strategies, we're going to use the post-it folder, um, this one right here, this one here. Each of you will have one of these. We're going to talk, you're going to write down your school district. We're going to have goal, a metrics. Now, a metric means that you can measure it. It's not like, you know, it has to have a number or percentage. And you know what? More than likely, the metrics is something that's public information because it's free. And you're going to have to pay for it, then you're going to have to come up with a budget to do it. So indicators can be measured, or what we call new metrics, that are readily available. The, data steer, uh, the National Clearing House, you have to pay a certain fee, but if it's all worth it, then that's something you can look at. Your AI's reports, your PINGS data. You can look at uh, how many students through your average daily attendance. All of these other information that you're going to look at. Then we're going to identify two strategies, strategy number one and number two. And let me tell you why these are going to be important. Remember we talked about, really, this is what's happening in my school. Now this is what's happening in my school district. Now we're going to start talking about strategies that brings us all together. And we're going to vote on them. Because we're going to pick these square that those strategies, we're going to measure them across as a collective cohort of school districts that we're going to work towards them in meeting the San Antonio 2020 goals and the diploma goals. So do you see how we went high? Excuse me, we went real high. This is 
what I do, this is what our school district's thinking of doing, and now we're going to align it to be very strategic. That's why it's called strategic. But we're going to have the way we're going to measure it. Here's the overarching goals that hopefully in alignment. And this is our school district looking together. This is like us going back to your superintendent, your presidents of your colleges, and saying, we've got two big, what we call quick wins. It might be hard, but it's something that we're going to do immediately as a priority that we're going to all work on it together to start really talking about how San Antonio is working as a collaborative to really get to those goals. Now, remember, uh, this is not individual. This is collective. These are things that we can do together. For instance, is it important for students to know about college, the common language? We heard that. How do we do that? Is that a goal? How do we measure that 100% of our kids know the language? Well, if we can't measure it, then more than likely that might be a real good goal to have, but then check it off, let's go to the next one. So you see, those are the conversations we need to have. 100% of my students will take SAT. Can you measure that? Yes. Is it doable? Yes. Is there activities and strategies that can do go to that? Yes. So those are the types of conversations we're going to have. But that means that your school district is going to, to kind of say, we're going to do that as a collective to move it as a for um, ISD strat, uh, co cohort to move that needle. So if you notice here, we're going to have that. And during session three, this is our, our activity number two. During activity number three, we're going to put these around the room and you're going to have five dots, and I'll go over the instructions, but we're not going to vote on which are our priorities, because each of them are different. And we're going to say, let's put it together, we'll bring it back again, maybe tomorrow, there's an activity there, where we're going to put together and, and kind of give you an outline of what your vote said. You know, y'all gave it the thumbs up. All right? So for right now, what we're going to do is this... Uh, this is the tool for college readiness. We're going to talk about a goal. We're going to talk about the metrics and two strategies that we're going to do. We should work it across, but this is what our, our goal is right here because that's what we're going to vote on, at least two strategies that we're going to work on together. Raise your hand if you have a question. Clarifications or need information. Here's an example that I'm going to share with you. This is an example of what, you know, expanding the uh, AP courses, getting more students in college uh, dual credit, getting quality teachers, etc. So your packet has those examples. I just wanted to show you that this is what we're going to be working on. We have approximately, and go back, oops, oops. We have 90 minutes for this activity, but we have to have a final product. So this, is no? An hour. We have one hour. Okay, we just stay corrected. We have an hour to do this activity. So 45 minutes, we have it clean. And then we have the 15 minutes to come back and report out and then activity number three, we're going to go ahead and vote on those priorities. Any questions? All right, let's go to your classroom.